Today I'd like to look at an interesting thing that happens when you use the quadratic formula to solve a linear equation. Well, we can take any linear equation bx plus c equals zero and then just add a zero x squared to it and now we have something that looks like a quadratic equation. Of course it's not exactly a quadratic equation, but what if we were to think of it as a quadratic equation and then try to use the quadratic formula to solve this, what would we end up with? Well, the answer is kind of surprising and leads us to look at a nice area of math that perhaps you haven't seen before. Okay, so how can we approach this? And I guess before we start approaching this, I'd like to maybe simplify the setup a little bit by saying that let's take b and c both to be non-zero here. So I can think about this equation here as the limit as a approaches zero of the equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So of course, talking about the limit of an equation doesn't really make a ton of sense. So perhaps what we should really be talking about is the limit of the solutions to this equation. And of course, if we're taking the limit as a approaches zero, that means a is never zero because limits are all about deleted neighborhoods, if you will. So let's go ahead and solve this. We know that the solution to this is x equals negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. And what we'd like to do now is, well, take the limit of this expression right here, this solution, with a approaching 0. But notice we've got a plus minus here. I think it's not too hard to do this all at once, but we're going to separate it out into two cases. So let's look at the first case when we look at the plus. So we've got the limit as a approaches zero of negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So how might we take this limit? Well, observe that it's an indeterminate form of type zero over zero. Notice the numerator cancels to zero because we've got negative b plus, well, the square root of b, which is plus b, over 2a. So perhaps, well, what should we do here? Well, I think maybe multiplying by the radical conjugate is not a terrible idea. So let's do that. So the radical conjugate will be b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, because we have to multiply by the radical conjugate in the numerator as well as the denominator. I guess maybe the traditional radical conjugate would change this plus to a minus, but if we just change this minus to a plus, it's like doing the same thing and multiplying by negative one, and I think it's nicer. Okay, so this is gonna give us the limit as a approaches zero of so multiplying this out will give us negative b squared plus b squared minus 4ac over 2a times b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. But now let's observe that some things cancel in the numerator. This b squared cancels with this b squared. And now our a's will cancel. So this a will cancel with this a. And then finally this 2 we'll cancel this four down to a two. And then we have a minus sign that we can pull out as well. So let's see what we have. Oh, and we might as well take a approaching zero here because the only a left doesn't give us a zero in the denominator or anything, so it's okay. So let's see, in the numerator we're left with minus two times c, and in the denominator we're left with b plus the square root of b squared. But the square root of b squared isn't b, it is the absolute value of b. So we have b plus the absolute value of b. So if we're keeping track of solutions over here, our first solution to this equation right here is 
2c over b plus the absolute value of b. Okay, so now let's look at our second solution that we gain from taking our quadratic formula with a minus sign. So the same thing is going to go here. This limit is going to be very, very similar. So we'll have negative b minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. We're going to do the same thing by multiplying by the radical conjugate. So now let's maybe take negative b plus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over the same thing because we've got to multiply in the numerator and the denominator. We don't want to change anything. Okay, so let's see where that leaves us. So we'll have the limit as a is approaching zero. We have a b squared minus b squared uh, plus 4ac after distributing that minus sign through. And this is going to be all over 2 times a times we've got this negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. Okay, so that's looking good, I think. But now we can do some more cancellations just like we did before. This b squared will cancel this b squared. And then this a will cancel this a. And then also the 2 will cancel the 4 down to a 2. And now we're left with 2c over. So we'll have negative b plus the square root of b squared. Oh, but that's going to be the same thing as we had before. Well, we've got to keep in mind of course, that the square root of b squared is the absolute value of b. So we have negative b plus the absolute value of b. Now I'm going to bring that minus sign up just to make it look more like this. And now we'll have this is our second solution. Negative 2c over b minus the absolute value of b. But observe that this denominator is going to be 0 all of the time. Well, at least one of these denominators is going to be zero all of the time. And that's because if you take this first one and we can simplify it two different ways. If b is bigger than zero, well then that means absolute value of b is the same thing as b. Those add up to 2b, which gives us the solution of minus c over b. But if b is less than zero, then b plus absolute value of b is zero, and we're left with a zero in the denominator, and I'm gonna think about this as infinity, because we've got non-zero in the numerator and zero in the denominator. Of course, maybe we're not being as careful as we could be here, but I'm gonna think about that as a solution at infinity. And then, well, we can do the same kind of game over here. So observe over here, if b is bigger than 0, well, then this stuff cancels and we get our solution at infinity. Whereas, if b is less than 0, then that's going to give us our negative c over b. So regardless of what happens, notice that these are two disjoint possibilities. We get two solutions this solution of negative c over b, and then this solution at infinity. So let's see if we can make sense of this using another branch of math called projective geometry. So in order to do that, we need to consider the following object. This is called the real projective plane, and I'm going to write it as rp2. And what it is, it's the quotient of three space, real three space, well, almost all of real 3 space, everything in real 3 space except for the origin, modulo an equivalence relation. So that means it's made up of equivalence classes. And how do we define the equivalence relation? Well, it's like this. So x, y, z is equivalent to r, s, t if and only if there exists a lambda which is non-zero that makes x equal to lambda r, y equal to lambda s, and z equal to lambda t. So in other words, one point is like a multiple of another point. So now let's observe the following. 
So if z is non-zero, oh, and I should point out before we really dive into this more, here we'll use the following notation for elements inside of RP2. So in other words, the equivalence classes. So it'll be this ordered triple, but instead of colons, or sorry, instead of commas, we'll use colons. Okay. So if z is non-zero, observe that the point x colon y colon z is the same thing as x over z, y over z, 1. Because we can just use our scaling factor of lambda as z, if z is non-zero, well then we can just divide by z and we get an equivalent point. So that motivates us to have the following decomposition of the real projective plane. So we can take RP2 and decompose it into, well, this first part, which is everything of the form x, y, 1, where x and y are allowed to be anything at all. That's because, well, that's not going to include the origin. Uh, which is the only thing that we're not allowing because this third coordinate is already not zero. But there will be a case when the third coordinate is zero and that's going to be everything else. So I'm going to write that like this. So x colon y colon zero and here x and y are both real, but they're also not both zero. So let's maybe write it like this. So not both zero. And then, well, let's observe that this first bit is really just a copy of R2 because it has all of the degrees of freedom of R2. Now this second bit, well, that's not really a copy of R2 because it doesn't include the origin. And in fact, if it doesn't include the origin, then what we could really do here is, well, when y is non-zero, we could divide by y and we'll get, uh, you know, x colon 1 colon 0, and then the same thing for x. So this is actually a copy of the real projective line, and we actually think about this as the line at infinity. Um, but it's not like a normal line, it's a real projective line, which has an infinite point itself. We're not going to go into that uh, super carefully. Okay, so now let's look at solutions to this in this world over here. So, now it may not seem like anything interesting is going to happen, but something will happen that will link us um, to what we saw before in our, you know, limiting procedure. So I'm going to drop the 0x squared because we won't need to worry about it in this case. So solutions to bx plus c equals 0 in Rp2. So first off, one thing that we need to do is homogenize this equation. So this is a linear equation, but it's not a homogeneous linear equation because notice we've got a linear term, the bx, and then we've got a degree 0 term, the c. And we'll homogenize this by replacing x with x over z. That's going to give us b times x over z plus c equals 0. But of course, we can multiply through and get bx plus cz equals 0. But now, that has infinitely many solutions. We could take x to be equal to lambda times c. And then we could take z to be equal to, let's see what it would be. It would be... Uh, minus lambda times b, and observe that here y is really allowed to be anything we want because it's not represented inside of the equation. Okay, so now let's take this and write it as an ordered triple in our real projective plane. So that means all of our solutions are of the following form. Lambda c colon y, or y is like some number, and then colon minus lambda b. Okay, nice. But now this like kind of naturally breaks apart into two pieces. Maybe the first piece that this breaks apart into is the case 
when lambda is equal to zero. So, well, if lambda is equal to zero, then observe that that means that y is not allowed to be zero. But if y is not allowed to be zero, then we can divide by y and scale this down to the point zero colon one colon zero. But notice that's one of the points at infinity or that's on the line at infinity. So I'll just put here in quotes that this is infinity. So this is like building another way, this infinite solution that we built via the quadratic formula. Now, of course, if lambda is not equal to zero, well, then we can divide this whole thing by minus lambda b, and we'll get the following. So let's maybe do that right here. Here. So like I said, this is when lambda is not zero. So that'll give us something like this. So we'll have minus C over B colon Y and then colon one. And now that's going to be, well, notice that's also infinitely many solutions, but it's infinitely many solutions along maybe one of the axes in our original copy of R2. So that would maybe represent in a loose sense this solution over here, which is minus C over B. So there you have it, two ways of looking at how we can get two solutions to a linear equation, AKA how to use the quadratic formula to solve this equation where the coefficient of X squared is zero. And that's a good place to stop.